as mentioned before, my name is Robert Krimmer. I'm uh, working on e-governance at Taltech. I mean, obviously, it's something that you think is really obvious that in Estonia we do academic research on e-governance. However, I'm the first professor of e-governance five years ago when I came here. And uh, so there is not that much happening right away, but we're really increasingly doing so. And you will hear two studies uh, right now where we talk about internet voting. Internet voting is probably was the fast or the last point that really manifested this leadership role of Estonia in this digital transformation uh, road trip that we're taking. Really, so uh, why why is e-voting or internet voting this important element? Because basically, if you look at this world map that I've put together, uh, where you see with green countries that do electronic voting machines or uh, ballot scanners and red ones that have stopped using it in yellow, really mainly discussing them, there is only one country, and that is Estonia, that has actually introduced internet voting without any limits for any citizen for any election in the world. There is no one else that has done that. Other countries have introduced it mainly for people living abroad, for local elections, or generally, you know, are just still trying it out. Estonia is the only country that has really introduced it full-blown since 2005. And we all know the story, you've heard about it in the last parliamentary elections, there were over 40% of the voters that have selected internet voting to cast their vote. However, how did it happen, or how did it come there? So basically, when you start thinking about introducing or changing your electoral process, you really need to see why. And one of the, the reasons is really that there is a general turnout decline in the world, right? So we can see where in, throughout the world an overall average that since the late 70s, the global voter turnout is going down. There was a little bit of a pike uh, after the change in Eastern Europe, really the reintroduction of democracy there. So a little bit of a, of a spike, but still overall tendency is going down. So even if we talk about the established uh, countries in the West, it's going down, but also for the post-communist countries where there has been a large drop of initial relatively respectable turnout numbers and then went down. But even if we talk about Estonia, we have a decline of voter turnout, so that it ends up somewhere between 50% for local elections and some 60 plus percent for um, elections on the national level. So we have a problem of bringing people to the polls. Right? So what can you do? You can basically uh, try to increase the convenience for the voters to participate. Right? So you can make it easier to access this democratic challenge, to actually uh, participate in the celebration of democracy, as you could call it. Right? So you could make it easier. Right? So how can you make it easier? You basically have two ways. On the one hand side, to adapt the administrative procedures and go and expand uh, in... Uh, uh, the ways that you allow to vote, right? So think about postal voting, right? That you can vote outside the polling station, that you think about allowing people to vote much in advance is basically the second uh, channel where you actually allow for different uh, time, right? And um, altogether, when you start introducing different voting channels, different ways of how you can participate in an election, you're increasing the complexity, right? If you not only have one polling station where you can go and participate in the election, when you have multiple ways, think about voting on a ship, think about voting a month in advance in, in, in a small town hall, or even going to a shopping center where you can uh, observe the election. So if you have time, go to the Solaris shopping center, which is basically just some five minutes walk from here, and there is one polling station where you can vote for the European Parliament elections, right? So go shop and then vote, right? That's one way of increasing uh, the availability of the elections. And one, of course, is introducing internet voting. But it's not that easy to uh, transform elections, right? So it's really about introducing additional channels. It is something that increases the timeline, right? When you think about informing the voters that you could participate in different voting channels, that's going to be, it needs time to inform them. It also means that when you do that, you should first think, so what is the concrete need that I have to introduce an electronic voting channel. So what is the problem in my elections? Is it to count quicker, right? Because you might have very complex elections that really require a lot of different races to be counted. Is it maybe something where you have people living abroad that really have a hard time to come in uh, to your election? Think about Ireland, right? 
There is a population of about 4 million people, but there is a diaspora of 20 million. Okay, so if the Ireland would actually allow for postal voting, that would have a huge impact. Five times the electorate abroad, right? What does that mean? You cannot really control the political outcome anymore. So no wonder that Ireland is not going for introducing postal voting or forms of remote voting there, right? So uh, on the other hand, if you think about uh, Orange County, which is basically the district around LA, they actually have a quite direct democratic uh, process. So you can basically vote on anything, right? Voting for the mayor, okay, that's logical. Voting for the school board president, voting for the chief of police, et cetera, et cetera. It basically leads to a booklet thick like that where you have to do several choices to make, right? And to count that when you have 10 million voters, right? It takes a lot of time. So they have to use IT tools to get, get support in that. So what makes sense is that as part of a feasibility study when introducing electronic means to identify what is the concrete need and then have the right technology to use for that. Uh, these feasibility studies should also include something like a piloting, right? We'll start first small with a small area where you have limited risk levels, and if it goes wrong, you know, you can get rid of the technology easily, or you can expand much larger. So the general rule that you could say there is always think about the election after next, right? Think what you can test in this election and then introduce in the next election. That's the number one rule, I would say, as a recommendation if you think about introducing uh, new means of... Uh, uh, voting for, for an election. Legislation is usually the last point or the first point to start your journey. If you start first, you have always the hand and the egg problem. Do you know which technology you're going to use? Or the other way around, do you know the law to select the right technology? And so you always have this uh, problem of how to adapt what to what, right? So that's really an important part where, legis where feasibility studies can help you. Accountability is an issue with electronic voting, right? We cannot touch, see, or feel bits and bytes, right? Or have you? I haven't, right? With paper ballots, we can see it easily, right? We know how it goes from our mind to the paper, the paper into the ballot box, and how you count the paper ballots. But how you can do that with electronic voting, it's difficult. So you need to have new means like end-to-end -end verifiability and other elements that help you with that that also Estonia has introduced. So this transparency challenge is really, really something that you need to bear in mind. You need to train the people that use the electronic voting system. You need to train them how to use the system. You also need to train the citizens, right? No wonder did it take uh, over 10 years to get to the high levels of, of voter turnout that we see now. In the first internet election in Estonia in 2005, there were only 2% of the voters, some 10,000 voters that used internet voting, right? So it started small, but then really increased quite heavily in the usage rate. You also need to have some form of certification, so external uh, evaluation of your technology so that you know that it works correctly. And then you need to have the proper oversight and management so you can be sure that it's going to be a success not only for one election but on the long run. So we actually analyzed really this uh, complexity and trying to understand the problem. So there are some unsolved questions when we talk about electronic voting, which of course are always important for academia to use in their discussions. On the one side, are the effects of e-voting really beneficial uh, to democracy? Okay, that's going to be a bit difficult to answer, but we can already say, and you will hear that from Mikkel later on, so there are some impacts that we can already know uh, about uh, electronic voting, what impact they had. But of course, we have democratic quality, that's something always hard to measure, and we'll see about that. Maybe we can discuss that later. One thing that we uh, hope for always is that e-voting really increases the turnout. What we can say so far, if at all, it will have had a very limited impact. But what it probably helped to solve is to keep the turnout at a certain level. It really helps to bring the people back uh, to the election, or at least keep them with the election. But that's not really my area of expertise. Uh, what we really studied was this complexity of the administrative process and really how much does an e-vote cost, right? Do we know what it really costs to introduce electronic voting? And to do that, Many people really take just the cost of an e-voting program and divide it by the overall uh, total number of voters, right? That will give a very arbitrary number. We don't really know if that uh, goes to the cost of the process and similar issues. And so we developed a new way of uh, uh, approaching the topic. So on the one side, we first narrow down the electoral cycle. When we know that there are multiple voting channels, 
we know that basically the costs are very much the same when it comes to running the voter register, uh, administering the or registering the candidates for an election. That's the same for any voting channel. We also know that compiling the results is also going to be the same amount of administrative costs. So we excluded that from our analysis. What we looked at are only the processes which are different between the different voting channels. And I will give you some figures on the different voting channels in Estonia in a little bit. We then looked at the process mapping, right? So we really modeled the processes of all the steps involved in administrative, administering the elections. And then we had a list of activities and assigned average costs to that. So wherever we knew, we assigned those specific costs for the activities like the kilometers that were driven by the election officials, like, for example, the paper that is used in the election and so on. So then we attributed those costs and then we transferred them down to the voting channels. So what are our findings? We basically have uh, analyzed six voting channels. So on the one side, we looked at advanced voting in general, right? That is voting before election day, uh, both in county centers, which is basically on the district level. And um, we also looked at it in an ordinary polling station. So some polling stations are already open before election day. We also looked at the early voting and counting centers, which is happening before basically the first half of those six additional days that are available in Estonia. We also looked at uh, election day voting in county centers, which is on the district level and in the ordinary polling stations. So basically, the I, let's see if I have no, I don't have a pointer. But basically, the um, uh, second from the bottom is the one which we normally call the normal voting in a polling station, right? So what you know from voting on election Sunday, and then we the last one we have internet voting in Estonia. So these six voting channels are are actually only a fraction of the 13 that are available in Estonia. So we didn't look at voting on a ship and others which are very hard to catch in academia. But what can we say? Really, the standard form of voting is quite cost efficient, right? I mean, we have a range between 2.80 uh, euros and 3 euros. That's relatively cost efficient, we can say. What is really expensive is any form of advanced voting on paper. Maybe in supermarkets, there it's relatively okay because we have a good number of voters participating, but where it's difficult is advanced voting in ordinary polling stations. Almost nobody goes there. And that really drives up the price of almost like five times the cost of voting on election Sunday. But what is really, really cost efficient, what you can see also from that figure, is advanced voting through the internet. It really is the most cost efficient version of voting. It's almost at two thirds of the cost of paper voting on election Sunday. And although still a majority of voters vote on election Sunday, so really breaking that down. So we are at about a little bit more than two euros uh, for internet voting. That's really something where we already, we had a hint, but it, of course it's easier when you have 44% of the votes being cast electronically. So in order to, to summarize, right, what is really important introducing electronic channels to an election is, think about proportionality, does it, add to your election? Does it actually solve a problem? Yeah? When we introduce new technologies, it's important that they still live up to the same standards that we have for paper elections. Right? Electronics is nice and great. It can add a lot of additional values, but it cannot be worse than paper elections. Right? And that's where it gets challenging to understand it fully. I mean, we all know crypto is great, but it's hard to really explain to the average person. So, what we also can say is internet voting is not a trend, right? It's not a must. It is something that can complement your election, and Estonia is probably the best place to learn about that, but it's not something that's for everyone. It makes sense for certain elements, in particular when you have a widespread electorate that lives far away from the elections uh, polling station, and it's hard for them to participate in elections. So as a form of remote voting, and you want to have something that's cost efficient. That's when it really helps. And what you need is to have trust and maximum transparency in order for it to maintain, because it's as easy as that to claim I made an attack on an internet voting system and it's hard to prove the other way around. And with that, sometimes the trust and the confidence of the people can be destroyed in no time. With that, I thank you for your interest and I'm looking forward to your questions in a little bit. Thank you, Professor Kurima. Thank you, sir.